Good morning. I'm Stas Margaronis, president of the Propeller Club of Northern California. And the Propeller Club of Northern California and the Society of American Military Engineers welcome you to this Storms Flooding and Sea Level Defense Conference 2020. Our, before I introduce our first speakers, uh, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping issues. And um, one of which is to note that most of our speakers are limited to seven minutes. And I will warn you on your sixth minute, but uh, uh, several of our keynote speakers will be speaking longer. And uh, our guest, our keynote speaker this morning is Jeroen Ertz uh, from BU Amsterdam. And uh, he will be speaking after our first uh, panel. Um, I will ask uh, people to uh, send us their questions at the conclusion of each of the panels. And I will ask for questions. If you could <clears throat> ask your question, identify yourself and your affiliation, I would appreciate it. If we don't have enough time for your questions, please send me an email at apmargaronis at gmail.com. Um, with the question and the individual that you want the question forwarded to, and I will forward that to the panelists. Um, the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, will be made available uh, to registered attendees um, for those PowerPoints that we are authorized to do so. Uh, one of the ports uh, uh, has a rule that they prohibit the PowerPoints being distributed so that won't be distributed, but everybody else's who we have permission to do so uh, will be made available. Uh, and I hope uh, within a day or two after the conference. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I want to do two things and I did it before, but I will do it again. And the first thank you um, is to Arvin Acharya president of the Society of American Military Engineers. Arvin has been a real support and help for this conference. Uh, he has brought in a uh, national uh, group of engineering firms and analysts and consulting firms who work on uh, Army Corps of Engineers projects, waterway projects, coastal projects, and Arvin, I want to thank you very, very much for all of your assistance and support. Um, I also want again to thank uh, Todd Crawshaw, who has, uh, he and I have been going through the ups and downs of the Zoom world. And uh, hopefully the next time we do this, Todd, it will be a more painless process. Uh, but Todd was up last night very late getting out uh, uh, attendee information because there was some confusion about one thing and another. So I hope that that's taken care of. So <clears throat> uh, without further ado, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, a couple of uh, organizations, starting with my board at the Propeller Club of Northern California. And I want to specifically thank my board Ron Brown with the uh, Port of Oakland, uh, Kimberly Cartagena, Centerline Logistics Corporation, uh, Greg Feeney at Port Transfer, uh, Nick Marone, Vice President of the Seafarers International, Susan Sullivan with the Pesha Group, uh, Anita Yao, who I know is here. Hi, Anita, Port of San Francisco, uh, Alice Heron, Golden State Renewable Energy, Susan Ransom, SSA International, and Evie Wong, uh, Abba Wheels Up. Uh, I also want to thank our sponsors, and uh, we will be uh, showing the sponsors' names uh, at the break, but I want to thank them, uh, beginning with the Propeller Club of Northern California and the Propeller Club International, Niels Allen, the president, is here. Niels, thank you for your participation. Uh, all of the chapters of the Society of American Military Engineers, uh, thanks to Arvin, uh, we have a national uh, representation at this conference. Uh, Stantec, uh, Noble, Ugro, Jacobs, Mead and Hunt, 
Towill, Port of Long Beach, thank you very much for your contribution. Cargill, Port of San Francisco, Port of Los Angeles, Gilbane, Port of Oakland, thank you very much. And Danny, again, thank you for being here. Uh, Watermaster, North America. Uh, thank you all. If I have missed anybody who is a sponsor, uh, please uh, flag either Arvin or myself and uh, we will uh, get your names up uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we have some student interns who are uh, on this uh, meeting this morning and I just want to give them a shout out. Uh, Connie Worthen, Civic Spark Fellow. Desiree Sausale, Civic Spark Fellow. Madeline Travis, who's been helping us out with a conference, Civic Spark Fellow, Andrew Bake, uh, Nicole D'Amato, Lake County. Uh, Nicole, thank you very much for your participation. Laura Ammons, thank you very much for your support. Laura's a Civic Spark Fellow. Uh, Madeline Vine, St. Mary's College. Madeline, thank you very much. Uh, Yassi Sarvian, uh, UCLA. Lucas Winkler Prince. UC Berkeley, Alberto Fernandez Perez, IH Cantabria in Spain, David Bazet, Rutgers University, Peyton Real, St. Mary's College, Rosa Nelson, St. Mary's College, and Helen Zhang, UC San Diego. Students and interns, thank you very much for your attendance. As I said last year at the conference, you are our future. And it's very, very important that we have your participation at this time. This morning, we have a group of distinguished individuals who will be doing, uh, who will be welcoming uh, our delegates and participants. Uh, we begin with Danny Wong, uh, Executive Director of the Port of Oakland. Uh, Danny introduced and uh, the delegates last year when we were uh, at Scott Seafood. Unfortunately, we can't be there this year. Um, I think it's safe to say, Danny, that uh, when you applied for the job, some of the uh, challenges that you faced in 2020 were probably not in your job description. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> So I think it's 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 been a it's certainly been an interesting year for the Port of Oakland. Um, uh, Danny uh, will be followed by uh, Tony uh, uh, Gioello, uh, with who is the uh, Deputy Executive Director of the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, Niels Allen, as I said, uh, with Propeller Club International, and finally uh, Arvin Acharya with Sane. Uh, Danny, welcome to our conference. Thank you very much for being our first speaker. 2020 has been a tough year. Uh, thank you for your participation and you have the floor. Well, thank you, Stas. Um, uh, I'm really grateful for our longtime partnership with the Propeller Club and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, yes, like you said, even though we could not once again meet in person um, at the Port of Oakland, I give everyone a virtual welcome today. And indeed, Stas, I took the job of the Executive Director at the Port of Oakland, what, in November of uh, 2019, uh, uh, thinking that was going to be uh, years of, I mean, a year of very good planning, uh, setting course for our future. Lo and behold, uh, come March, the Grand Princess cruise ship pulls up on our uh, docks, and uh, we are now have been in emergency mode ever since. So it is uh, indeed being a very interesting experience. Uh, let's put it that way, interesting, and uh, hopefully that uh, it makes me and everybody uh, better people uh, as we confront further challenges. Certainly, the topic today is a challenge that is deeply relevant to the Port of Oakland as we, the port, manage 19 miles of uh, seafront and waterfront. Included in this is the Oakland International Airport, the seaport, and commercial and visitor-oriented real estate uh, in between. The port provides the platform for transportation and commercial businesses that generate about 85,000 jobs in the Bay Area. And we transport much of the goods exported from California, especially the Central Valley and imported for Northern California consumers. Interesting enough, 
even though my air, our airport is suffering because people are afraid to fly these days, the seaport is doing fairly well because people are buying more uh, toilet paper. And in fact, yesterday I was talking to somebody who said uh, her husband insisted on buying a bidet because he didn't want to deal with toilet paper anymore. Well, that bidet came from China, I'm sure. So um, uh, my friends, um, now is the moment though that we must move to action on sea level rise and it's a uh, root cause the climate crisis. Uh, we will soon, whether whatever your party affiliation is, we will soon have a federal administration that actually believes that these issues are actually real. And uh, we will have at least four years and hopefully thereafter to amplify the issues that be denied at the federal level for a long time. Uh, I know there are many good people working at the federal government who believes this, but it is the administration that is in power that is important. I will tell you a Port of Oakland experience to illustrate the importance of this change at the federal level. Uh, the port is spending approximately anywhere from 30 to 60, depending on which day you're talking, which phase you're talking about, million dollars, mostly out of the port's own funds to raise the height of the perimeter dike around the airport to prevent flood water intrusion uh, into the runways during a 100 year storm. Well, our uh, port staff uh, very uh, appropriately and smartly thought that this would be a good opportunity to also do an investigation as to the additional impact of sea level rise to the flooding scenarios. So when we approached, uh, but when we approached our federal regulators and partners for assistance and approval, we got an official non-recognition of the sea level uh, rise as an issue. No recognition, no discussion, and no help. So federal recognition is important not only because of the funding opportunities, but also because sea level rise and climate change cannot be tackled port by port, city by city, or even state by state. Uh, the Port of Oakland, along with our sister ports up and down the coast of the United States West Coast, has long owned our responsibility to uh, reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases and other pollutants. There, for example, the Oakland Board of Port Commissioner has adopted a plan to implement every feasible technology towards a zero emissions port. The ports in California are beating all our competition in the United States, east and south coasts, in the fight against greenhouse gas emissions. Yet sadly today, I gotta tell you that the very same California ports are so far losing the competition in terms of the share of business measured in terms of cargo volume we are losing market share to the East and the West Coast ports. Part of the reason is that shippers decide where to ship their containers partly based on the degree of regulatory burden to, of each port. There is no denying that California has much more stringent environmental air quality regulations than the rest of the country. Every time I visit, uh, well, I haven't visited that many times, but the two times I did visit uh, shippers overseas, one of the questions they always ask is, well, how come your regulations and environmental regulations are so much more complicated than the South and the East? And that's one of the considerations they take into when they decide where to ship their cargo, especially now the Panama Canal allows them to go bypass the West Coast. My message here is not that California should relax its commitment to combating climate change, but that we must have a federal standard and commitment so that the rest of the country adopt the same level of regulatory and funding commitment to issues like climate change, greenhouse gases, and especially today's topic, sea level rise. This will have the effect, and we need that, to level the playing field, so to speak, so that California ports can thrive in the same regulatory environment and commitment envir uh, environment as the rest of the country. With that, I look forward to all the ideas that will be exchanged at this conference to move us forward to a national and international effort to slow climate change and mitigate sea level rise. And again, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for holding this conference. Danny, thank you very much. And uh, we really appreciate this. And uh, uh, I think clearly a federal standard uh, would allow all boats to rise at the same level. Uh, Tony Gioello, 
uh, is the uh, Deputy Executive Director for Development at the Port of Los Angeles. Um, he is uh, a very experienced person from the engineering department about uh, engineering department related to challenges uh, towards the structure of terminals uh, at the port. Uh, and he and I've had several conversations about some of the issues involved there. Uh, Tony, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, first, just uh, I want to thank the uh, Propeller Club of Northern California and the Society of American in uh, Military Engineers in Northern California for allowing the Port of LA to say a few opening remarks and to welcome the participants of the 2020 Storms, Flooding, and Sea, sea Level Defense Conference. It was interesting. I as I was looking at the agenda for the next two days, I was struck by the magnitude of the resources being deployed to address the serious challenges that we face to protect our coastal assets. But at the same time, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, we're just scratching the surface of the needs to mitigate these threats. And, and I guess that's why these conferences are, are so important, so that we can build awareness and create a dialogue among all our various agencies and to share best practices and ideas. And like Danny says, I think, you know, to work together to make sure there are policies and resources available to address these issues. Um, so again, I, I think, uh, thank you for having and, and hosting this conference. Um, like all of you, like Danny said, you know, 2020 has brought in many challenges uh, to the Port of Los Angeles. Currently about half our workforce is telecommuting, the other half comprised of our construction and our construction and maintenance forces, our port police and our port pilots have continued to come to work to maintain operations. Yeah, in the early year, we saw sharp declines in cargoes coming through the port complex, like, like all the ports did. But today, we're seeing record volumes coming through the ports. It's interesting to note that um, I started in the port here in 1980 and as a young, very young student. Um, so when the, we move car, we move in two weeks today, and maybe even less than two weeks, when we move the entire year in 1980, 81. And so, I mean, it's, it's amazing the amount of cargo going through these port complexes today. Now we do anticipate the sharp rise in cargo volume will, will stabilize in the coming months. You know, as, as the stores and warehouses restock and the American consumer begins to return to some type of normal lifestyle, whatever that may look like. Um, but even with cargo volume stabilizing, we still anticipate growth in volumes over the next decade. And to mitigate the impacts of cargo growth, the ports of LA and Long Beach, um, like most of the ports in California actually, have set a goal for zero emission cargo handling facilities. Now our, our goal is by 2030 to have zero emission facilities within the park complex and, and like the state has announced, zero emission trucks by 2035. Uh, zero emission equipment is still at a very early stage of development and to achieve the goals, we'll be testing over 80 pieces of zero emission cargo handling equipment over the next two to three years and along with our regional partners, we'll be testing over 100 zero emission on-road trucks over the next three years. Now, I can't tell you exactly what a zero emission port will look like in 10 years, but chances are it will be much more to be dependent upon electric power than current operations. So this brings me to an aspect of climate change that recently impacted port operations that I just wanna highlight. Uh, several months ago, we had these uh, extreme heat events uh, in California, and this was an eye-opener that highlighted to us the infrastructure challenges we face if we are truly to be a zero emission complex in the future. Now, just days before the extreme heat events were forecasted, the major ports in California were asked to look for ways to conserve and shed as much power usage as we could so that power could be diverted to other uses in the state to avoid rolling blackouts. Now, this meant we did not plug ships into shore power for several days now, fortunately, this did not impact cargo movement, but it did increase emissions into the air. So as our container terminals and our other facilities move towards greater electrified operations in order to achieve zero emissions, stopping the movement of cargo to avoid rolling blackouts is not a strategy that we want to rely on. I've seen estimates that put the hit to the U.S. economy at around $2.5 billion per day if West Coast ports are shut down. Our ports and the entire transportation industry will need reliable and resilient power as we move towards zero emissions. What this calls for is a massive investment into the state's electrical infrastructure. Uh, it is obvious we cannot electrify our terminals and, and our on-road vehicles without a major upgrade to power generation and distribution throughout the state. 
especially in light of the extreme heat and other extreme weather conditions. To finish up and wrap up my comments, I wanna say a few words regarding some of my observations regarding changing weather patterns and, and observe and what I have observed in the port complex over the last few years and how our developments may have mitigated some of these impacts. It was approximately six years ago, I think, when uh, Hurricane Marie uh, hit our port and, and uh, or actually the remnants of the hurricane, it wasn't even the hurricane, um, and, and damaged our federal breakwater. Yeah, I think it breached uh, three or two, two or three different holes in the breakwater, uh, about $20 million worth of damage. And it was interesting though, that even though the breakwater was breached, um, and there was some increased wave action in the port complex, it was not enough to impede crane operations for the loading and unloading of cargo. And when we looked at this, it was more than likely this is the re result of our, um, uh, of, of our large la Pier 400 landfill that we completed in uh, the year 2000. Now this landfill created protection for our berthing facilities from waves generated from south of the port. And I bring this up probably more to put a little bit of context to some of the agenda discussions today on how perhaps land reconfigurations can help mitigate potential sea level and extreme storm, uh, storm events as we look to solutions for this challenge. So again, um, just welcome to everybody. Thank you for listening. And I hope everyone has a wonderful conference experience, safe holidays, and hopefully a better 2021. So thank you. Tony, thank you very much for that. And thank you very much for the insight about Pier 400, which uh, I think is a, a bellwether uh, sign about how we need to be looking at some of our designs uh, going on in the future. Uh, our next speaker is Niels Allen, uh, president of the Propeller Club International. Uh, he is uh, uh, on location, uh, working, about to go work at a ranch, and uh, we uh, interrupt him from his busy schedule. Uh, Niels, thank you very much again for coming and uh, being with us at the conference, and uh, thank you for your participation. Thank you, Stas. Uh, a warm welcome to y'all. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, a warm thanks to the Propeller Club of Northern California. I'm very proud as your international president of the Propeller Club that you're hosting this special event. I had the pleasure of being there in person last year and I was impressed. But looking at this agenda, the national and international speakers, the topics, this is exciting program, an important program. So thanks, uh, Stas, to your, to your team and to the Propeller Club. I know you had a long list of people that you thanked. So I thank them again, I don't have the list. You know, we're in this uh, COVID pandemic and it has created all types of problems and issues. I think we're all kind of fatigued with the Zoom meetings perhaps, but we're doing the best we can. What I'm proudest of is how our industry has stepped up as essential workers to keep commerce going. Uh, we have our families, we have our concerns, health issues, but we suit up and we show up. Uh, down in the Gulf, uh, we're used to working during hurricanes. We grab our laptop, we can set up remote centers, but nobody expected to be nine months out working remotely. So congratulations to you and your team for putting this great program together. I note the national and international speakers, the collaboration that I know that'll come, the sharing, these are very important topics. You now we look at this year, and we've already gone through the alphabet with tropical storms and hurricanes, and we're now a third of the way through the Greek alphabet. <laughs> I have a family living with me that lost their home in Lake Charles, and they uh, decided, decided to get a, a fresh start in Houston with a new home, but they're living with us. And you look at the number of storms, uh, tropical depressions that have come through our area, and I just have held my breath each time. If a category five hurricane ever came up the Galveston Bay, it would be catastrophic. Uh, we all know that people like to live and work near the water. Uh, we also, uh, I think the consensus of everybody in this program would be that we care about the environment. I'm a sportsman. Uh, I want good things for my grandkids in the future. 
yet we all know that ports are vital to our regional, national, and international economies. So there has to be a balance. And I thought it was very interesting to talk about the regulatory conditions. Um, that does factor in. And perhaps there needs to be a, a level playing field, but one shoe doesn't necessarily fit all. And our areas are all diverse and different. I wish that I could be there in person with all of you, all of you. Maybe next year we can at Scott Seafood. Uh, once again, I thank you for this great program, and I'd like to keep my comments brief because of working for a trade association and putting a lot of conferences and meetings on. I know it's always better to be a little ahead of the schedule than to run over. So thank you very much for having us, and uh, good luck with the program. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for your leadership of the Propeller Club and all of the good things that you have done and your accessibility uh, to have made both of these conferences last year in person and this year virtually. Good luck and again, our warmest uh, welcome and gratitude. Our next speaker is Arvind Acharya, uh, president of the Society of American Military Engineers uh, and a good friend of mine of many years uh, who came to me in September and said, uh, look, I've seen this agenda and I think that we have a partnership possibility here. And uh, he has turned out to be absolutely right. We have a huge number of same uh, members uh, on uh, this uh, uh, call today. And uh, Arvin, we have you to thank for this and uh, your national organization and your various chapters around the United States and your members are very much the front line on a lot of these sea level storm surge and flooding issues and will continue to do so. So we are very grateful to have you here and to have your leadership. And Arvin, thank you very much. And uh, you have the floor, my friend. Thank you, uh, Stas Nels and the Propeller Club. On behalf of uh, the Society of American Military Engineers, San Francisco Post, I'd like to welcome everybody for this event. I also wanted to um, um, mention that uh, I wanted to thank the Propeller Club for allowing us to be partners with uh, for this event and be a co-sponsor. Um, a lot of the topics that are covered today and tomorrow are very much in alignment with the same national strategy, which focuses on infrastructure and disaster resilience. So we're very aligned. You know, last year I attended the event uh, live, uh, which you had at Scott Seafood, and uh, the feedback was so positive that I never thought that a year later we'd be, uh, you know, that I'd be with Sami and we'd be partnering. Who knew? Who knew? But uh, a year later, we're doing it live, so that's great. Um, there are many people I want to thank for uh, for this event, and I, I hope I don't miss them. I just wanted to mention uh, the groups because uh, SAMI is a national organization and uh, I belong to the San Francisco Post, which is a regional smaller post um, in the Northern California area. So um, we had reached out to posts uh, from South to North, you know, San Diego, Los Angeles, Orange County, Sacramento, San Francisco, that's just California. Then we reached out to uh, Seattle, New York, New Jersey, um, uh, Houston, Galveston, New Orleans, um, Hawaii, Guam. So you can see the, the network. We've reached out to so many posts and uh, we have to thank each of these posts for um, uh, sending this uh, event information out to their members because each post has their own members. And that uh, basically increases the outreach as you can see from the number of participants we have right now. Uh, there's another group that I want to thank, uh, which is uh, in SAMI National. Uh, there's a community of interest. It's called the Resilience Community of Interest. And uh, we had uh, reached out to them and they posted uh, this information on the SAMI national website, which again got a lot more interest. So uh, I want to thank all these different groups who have kind of indirectly or directly participated to make this event happen. Um, uh, lastly, I, uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, Stas and Nils and the Propeller Club for doing all the hard work really for this event. Um, and um, hopefully we can actually meet face to face next year in a non-virtual environment, which would be great. Um, so anyway, be safe and thank you very much. Arvind, thank you very much for your comments. 
and again for your support and for the support of all of your chapters. Uh, our next speaker is our keynote speaker. Uh, your own Ertz uh, is a professor at VU Amsterdam and he is the director of the Department of Water and Climate Risk. Uh, your own is an internationally recognized expert on sea level issues. He's traveled all over the world. Um, he is an inspiration for all of us because of his wide knowledge and experience. And uh, he was an advisor to me last year at our first conference. Uh, we got to uh, meet in Amsterdam last summer in 2019, and he came out for the uh, uh, American Geographic Union conference that happens uh, every December. So we, we were very close upon each other with our conferences last year. Um, I asked your own to talk about not just the issue of defending coastline, but also of the issue of adding value. And your own uh, will come, will be here, is here, and will be speaking about uh, role models in Shanghai, uh, role models in LA Long Beach, and role models in uh, Rotterdam. And your own, thank you very much for your uh, presence. I know it's a little later for you uh, in the Netherlands than it is for us, so thanks for staying up to be with us. And we welcome your keynote speech. Thank you, your owners. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stas. So I start with sharing my screen. Um, here we go. Okay. So uh, again, uh, thank you, Stas, for giving me the floor. Um, so my name is here, Jeroen Aert. I've been working uh, in several port cities around the globe for the last uh, 20 or 25 years. Um, in the United States, especially in New York, before and also in the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, recently also in Houston, together also with some colleagues I see here on the screen with uh, Texas A&M. And also quite recently in, the, uh, in California, especially in the ports of LA and Long Beach. Um, and I have a positive story to tell. Um, I know we face many challenges, um, uh, especially right now in the, in the pandemic and people are really waiting for something positive to put shoulders on something and to get things done. And that's my story of today, although we face challenges, but I think we can meet those challenges. Um, so it is about sea level rise. It is about uh, three ports, Shanghai, Rotterdam, and the ports of LA and Long Beach. And all of these ports are facing the same, let's say long-term threats. So I'm not talking about the pandemic right now. I know it's a difficult time. Um, and these long-term th uh, threats could be, or challenges could be summarized as follows. At one side, we have, let's say, the more natural challenges uh, like climate change and sea level rise. And we all know that, let's say by the uh, year 2100, uh, we may expect on average globally in, a rise in sea level of two to three feet. And it depends on the location where you are, how many feet it will be. Um, but there is also another challenge and that is uh, the socioeconomic trends and the projection that we see. Um, because according to this graph, and there are many of these kind of graphs, there will be a huge population growth um, facing uh, the globe, the world, uh, with also an increase in, in wealth and global GDP. And this will have an effect on ports because it also will mean an increase, an increase in trade. And when I um, prepared this speech, I, um, I uh, came across this uh, presentation, or sorry, this um, paper by Walsh et al, 2019. And what they did, they, they calculated the effect on the growth of ports due to the increase in trade. And uh, what you see here is uh, in a circle, uh, in a red circle, you see the effect for the US according to a low growth and a high economic growth scenario. And what they project that the area of ports in the US will grow by 60 to 200% because simply to accommodate, let's say the increase in trade. And this is until the year 2050. So this is also, I mean, this is a challenge, but this is also an opportunity. The question is how to do this, right? Because we also have this other challenge of sea level rise. 
And another paper also recently published, I think um, uh, it was last month or something like that, by Hansen and Nichols. They then um, calculated how much it cost to, let's say, uh, increase those ports around the globe. And they estimate a, a number of 200 to uh, almost 800 billion US dollars as investments. Most of these costs are indeed for creating new port facilities. And only 6% of these costs are then needed to make those new facilities and also the old facilities climate proof. So to repair it to the future. And what kind of yeah, um, measures do we then speak about in terms of climate adaptation? Well, simply you could say like that, that new port facilities need to be elevated, right? Because as Danny one was saying, uh, speaking about the port of Oakland with the challenges of a 100 year flood, we will see more of those 100 year floods. A uh, 100 year flood will become perhaps a one in 10 flood, right? So we need to elevate uh, new areas. With older areas, this is more difficult. It's quite expensive to elevate. Older areas and buildings that are already existing we need to protect with flood walls or flood proof individual buildings. Um, now let's go to Shanghai. Um, it's a very big city, 22 million inhabitants and quite low lying. And so the highest elevation in Shanghai is something like nine feet above sea level. And this is a, a satellite image of, uh, of Shanghai. It's located uh, near the ocean. Um, and its city center is also bordered by the Yangtze River, a very big river. And the port is also located along the Yangtze River. Um, and the city is already suffering from floods, not only from coastal storm surges from the sea, from uh, tropical cyclones, but also from extreme rainfall, for example. And this is a picture quite recently, actually. And uh, what we did is the following. We first started with a risk assessment, because if you want to invest as a port in climate adaptation, um, and, and, and making sure that your investments in, in new areas or new facilities are climate proof, you need to first know what are my risks, not only now, but also in the future. So on the left side, you see a picture, which was is a result of a computer model, where you see the expected inundation depths of a 100 year flood in the, under the current climate situation. And you see that there are some areas which uh, can expect flood depths of more than six feet. And on the right side, you see the same simulation, but then in the year 2100, when we have also sea level rise and perhaps also more rainfall. And you see that the inundation numbers are increasing. Um, so what does the city and the port do at this moment? Well, um, protection is, is, is important. So at, let's say the, the edges of the peninsula, at the border of the ocean, they've built massive sea dikes, sea walls, as you see on the right side picture. And along the river uh, Wangpu, uh, they have constructed uh, river dikes. So that's a, more or less the current situation. They have not so much invested in the city uh, in building codes, which you have uh, in the United States under the National Flood Insurance Program, for example. Um, so, so what can they do in the future? Well, one of the things that they are thinking of is perhaps damming off uh, this Wangpu River by a movable gate. So that's, that's a, a barrier which is essentially open during normal conditions, which, which closes during storm conditions. And in the picture in the uh, lower part of the, your screen, you see an existing small barrier uh, that is uh, located in one of the branches of this Wangpu River. So they have some experience already with floodgates. Um, but the problem is that if you would build, let's say, such a barrier in this Wangpu River, that also would mean that one of the older port facilities, which is located in the yellow parameter, um, would be maybe perhaps less uh, accessible. So that could be a problem in the future when this gate should yeah, be closed more often because of uh, sea level rise. Um, so what else can be done? Well, this is a picture of Shanghai uh, in 1984, so 35 years ago. And what you see is the city center and uh, everything around it was still forest, right? Now have a look at the red, ang uh, red uh, rectangle. I move now to the current situation and you see that uh, in the red angle, rectangle, there is new land being formed. So there's a huge re uh, land rec uh, reclamation project uh, has been uh, executed during the last uh, 35 years. And in fact, in China, over the last 70 years, 3.2 uh, million acres have been reclaimed from the sea. So it's quite huge. Uh, in China. 
Um, and if we zoom further in the rect, uh, red rectangle, you see a small gray line over here. And this gray line is actually a bridge of 20 miles from the mainland towards a recently created island. And on this island, they have created one of the largest port uh, container terminals of the world, this one. Um, and this container terminal is this, once again, outside of the city, 20 miles outside of the city. Now, and uh, now I move back to the city of Rotterdam because it appears that Rotterdam has followed the same strategy as Shanghai is following. So this is a picture of Rotterdam in Europe. On the left side, you see the North Sea, and this is the port, and here is the city of Rotterdam. And what you see in colors is actually the age of the port. So on the right side, uh, in the darker yellow, these are the older port uh, areas, and they, were, uh, they originate actually from the 15th century. And um, along, uh, let's say, the years, the port moved more and more outside towards the sea. So that means that on the left side, you see the newest port facilities, which were also reclaimed uh, and elevated to the highest point uh, of the port. And uh, all the, the main uh, container terminals are also located on these port facilities. And the second parallel to Shanghai is that Rotterdam has already created and developed a storm surge barrier, not only one, but even a second smaller one in the south. And the storm surge barrier, this is a picture of it, is also open during normal conditions and only closes when you have an, an, a really extreme event. And if you look at these barriers, they seem small, but I can tell you that the size of it is the same as, of one gate is the same as the Eiffel Tower. So this is approximately 600 feet long. Um, the other interesting aspect of the port of Rotterdam is depicted by this uh, old uh, aerial photography. And this is the port of Rotterdam, um, more the inland port areas in 1940, so right after the war. And what they have done uh, is because it was apparently less attractive to keep it as a port, is they have converted it into a residential area. And it now looks like this. And the, the, the reason for this is multiple. First of all, there was a, 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 a huge demand for residential uh, areas in the city. Um, and secondly, the port also thought, well, we are going to move outside for various reasons. And why don't we add value also? Eh? Um, because if you convert port area into residential area, um, it also adds value. The property uh, uh, value rises and with the money you also can make investments. And why is, uh, is, it, uh, is it attractive for developers? Well, people like to live near the water. So that means that also the the, the neighborhood also will be upgraded because there are also more expensive houses in this formerly poorer neighborhood. Um, Rotterdam also did, like Shanghai, um, um, a risk assessment, and uh, my colleagues of Rotterdam will tell something more about this in the tomorrow session, so I will be briefly only uh, showing this picture. Also, risk assessments so where can we expect flooding, because we have protection, but still we can, in extreme conditions, this is a one in thousand year flood even, we can have uh, damages. But I want you to show you a second picture because this is a picture um, showing you the direct damage of a flood to let's say the buildings and the, the warehouses in the port. But I also did an interesting uh, analysis of the so-called indirect economic damages. So if a part of the port of Rotterdam would be flooded by such an extreme event, it not only has a direct effect on the infrastructure of the city, no, it also has an effect on the neighboring countries even, in Germany and in Belgium. And this damage is even much larger than the direct damage to the ports. Uh, in this case, two and a half billion US dollars by only this one single event. Now we move to LA and Long Beach. Um, and this is a, a picture of the two ports. And I'm, I, I was an outsider when I entered the, the city and uh, I thought it was one port, but I have to be careful these are really two ports, but they are really next to each other. Um, but it's also interesting case because of that. Um, um, and also they did a very good job in, in, in assessing the risk. Uh, and they started together with USGS to make a very detailed analysis of um, what can you expect in terms of flooding and also assuming sea level rise. Uh, and this is still in centimeters. So that means that you have the current conditions, uh, a 100 year flood, 
and this is two feet of flooding, 75 centimeters, um, five feet of flooding, and approximately seven feet of flooding. And what is noticeable is that especially the older port areas in the back are the most vulnerable ones. And it is quite similar to Shanghai and Rotterdam. And if you then focus on the three um, red canals in the back, um, it is also logical and not surprising. Because if you look at this old aerial photograph of San Pedro Harbor in 1921, these three canals were actually dig or dug in a old swamp. So it is a low lying area. And on, on top of that, the area um, uh, was actually explored by oil companies. And because of the pumping, uh, there was also a huge uh, soil subsidence in the same area. Um, so what, what did they do, the two ports? Well, they made a plan, uh, a coastal resilience plan, and they looked for solutions. So what can we do right now in order to make sure that, th that those events have less damage? And um, well, on one side you have, let's say, flood protection, which is an option, uh, like inflatable barriers, um, upgrading the current bulkheads, um, looking at flood walls, uh, should we um, elevate them or uh, strengthen them, but also looking at uh, individual buildings and particularly at um, um, buildings that contain a critical infrastructure, like uh, power stations and so forth. Maybe you can drive flood proof them. Um, we, in our study, then added to this, let's say, current strategy, two additional strategies. One that we proposed is, uh, and that's also because of the, of the experience in other areas, to look a little bit broader than only the port area. Um, so we looked at, let's say, neighborhoods, um, which also could be flood proofed. And uh, for example, we looked at the water system because you have, uh, like in Rotterdam, you have a river coming from the north, uh, the LA River. And this also need to be upgraded. So the river dikes of, uh, of the river itself need to be upgraded to also protect the port. Um, what you also could do is not only look at technical solutions, but also so-called nature-based solutions in terms of beach nourishment in some points. And you also can then upgrade the bulkheads and so forth. So this is a, a sort of enhanced option of, of the current strategy of the two ports. And the third strategy is then inspired by what is happening in Shanghai and Rotterdam of moving the port more outwards, seawards. So what we, what we then propose in this strategy is that we convert the older low-lying port areas into a residential area, separate this area by a green buffer zone so that there is not so much noise um, uh, in the neighborhoods, and then create a new uh, port area within the perimeter of the uh, outer breakwaters over here. And the nice thing about it is that, that you can have a sort of trade because this will uh, also uh, add value to the, to the whole neighborhood. Um, and uh, some of the money you can use as an investment in this port area over here. The other interesting aspect, and that's what I try to advocate here, is this, this, this more systems dynamics. So the, 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 a strategy where you not only look at your own port operations, but look more broader yeah, in conversation with cities, with city planners, and see what is possible, is to um, create a dam over here and a shipping lock over here. And this will mean that the inland canals over here will convert from salt water into fresh water over time. And this is interesting because it makes it attractive for the neighborhoods, but it also, um, sorry, it also will create a sort of buffer, a freshwater buffer for saltwater intrusion uh, for the groundwater and protect the groundwater of Los Angeles, which is already suffering because of the droughts. Well, does it make sense economically to do these kind of things? Yes, uh, because if we look at the benefit cost ratios of these kind of investments, under different scenarios of sea level rise, two feet, five feet, and seven feet, you see positive cost be uh, benefit cost ratios. So that means for every dollar invested, you get a return between two and five dollars. Not next year. No, this is a long-term investment. And let me be clear of that. Um, and it is not only about, let's say, the return on your investment in terms of reducing flood risk. No, what we try to advocate in this story is that there are co-benefits. Okay? So with creating residential areas, you add value to the neighborhood. Um, if, you, if you think of, let's say, expanding the ports outwards 
and uh, uh, to, for example, address the socioeconomic growth and the increase in trades, um, um, you also do it on, at a higher elevation and thereby protecting the areas in the back. So there is, there is a win-win situation, so to say, of climate adaptation and also economic, uh, uh, accommodating economic growth. Now, there is one thing that is difficult and that is uncertainty. So when should we do these kind of investments? And um, for example, this is a picture by NOAA showing you the rates of sea level rise. And you see there are differences across the US uh, seaboards. Uh, in New York and New Jersey, it's 0.16 inch per year. Whereas in Galveston is higher. It's 0.26 inch per year. Um, and this is difficult. I mean, also for poor directors to make decisions about investments, when to invest, when to shift gears. And one of the things that you could do is use this framework. It's a so-called adaptation pathway framework. Let me explain you briefly. On the left side, you see the three strategies. So this is the current strategy proposed by the ports of LA and Long Beach. It costs, well, we have enhanced it a little bit, but so it costs 1.4 billion. Then we have the enhanced protection. So where you also raise the river dikes and so forth, 2.3 billion. And to move the port seawards, uh, I think it is a little bit, uh, we did not count everything, but at least uh, three to 4 billion US dollars. And the interesting point here is that you could start already with the current proposals of the two ports. But then you need to know when do we have to shift gears? So move, let's say, from the current strategy to the enhanced protection strategy and later on perhaps to the port seawards. And that depends, for example, on how much sea level rise do we have? And we think that, um, well, one feet of sea level rise, that's really a moment that you should maybe think of, of shifting gears. Um, and the, the nice thing about this approach is um, uh, so that you, that you don't have to invest everything right now. So you, you have the time and you have the time to learn over time from climate change, for example, and when you have more accurate data, but you already are prepared for the future. So the takeaways, and it's my final slide also, investing in climate change adaptation is economically efficient. And the combinations of flood protection and spatial planning solutions create co-benefits and um, by using this adaptation pathways framework, you remain flexible and spread costs over time. Thank you very much for your attention. Jerome, thank you very much for that very thought provoking uh, uh, presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I want to, I, I think one of the issues here is that, and, and Tony, and we were talking about this with Tony about the uh, level of infrastructure investments and the reluctance in recent years uh, for us to have uh, uh, investments in infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You heard from Danny Wan that he's advocating that there needs to be a national regulatory environment that needs to parallel an infrastructure environment that takes into account the new situation that we are facing, and we're going to hear shortly from the uh, 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 panel from Texas about their plans for Texas and then uh, Louisiana. So uh, in terms of the costing that you described in your presentation, uh, are, what was the basis of the projections you own on, on what those uh, cost uh, projections were? Yes, so what we did is we first calculated the current and the future flood risk. So what can you expect in damages every year? And this is obviously a statistical damage because we don't know when there will be a flood event. And then um, we, we suppose assumed some kind of investments in, in flood walls or other type of, of flood proofing measures. And they come at a certain cost, but they also last for let's say 50 or maybe 80 years. So what you can do then is do a cost benefit analysis where you actually weigh the investment cost of flood proofing measures against how much flood damage will be reduced. And that's essentially a cost benefit analysis. Very good. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, if you want to use the chat function and ask uh, questions, uh, this would be the time to do it. Uh, do we have any uh, questions? I'm gonna 
give everybody a chance to go at that. Uh, uh, Tony Juello, since you're here, uh, could you maybe uh, give us some uh, comment about what you saw in your own presentation? Sure. Um, no, one, I think, is very visionary. Uh, you know, we 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 talked a little bit before the conference, and we 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 looked at the uh, the the um, uh, the concept, and and I I do think it's visionary, and I think you know something like like that proposal. Um, it's something you start doing once and uh, make sure I word this correctly. The need is, is, is evident, right? I mean, it, it's, it's in, it's probably something you go with if it means survival or, you know, decline and not have a port anymore. Right. And so I, I think it's something that needs to be uh, on the table in a discussion. Now it's, um, like we also talked about it and, and like uh, you brought up in the beginning, you know, the, the big challenge or a, one of the biggest challenges is going to be jurisdictional issues. Uh, you know, this is developing container facilities in the Port of Long Beach area today and, and taking away container facilities in the LA area. And that probably only can ever be really happen if it is one port complex, which is way above my pay grade and, and probably my lifespan <laughs> in, in, in getting it to occur. Uh, would have to be the state of California coming down saying, you know, uh, because we have uh, potential catastrophic issues here, we need to address this. We need one big port complex to work together to do that. Um, but I think it's a viable, I would say it's an interesting and, and potentially viable solution once it gets to the point, or I shouldn't say once it gets to the point, because obviously it's going to take decades to actually implement but but uh, once it gets to the point where somebody or where, where the jurisdictions say we need to do something to survive as a port okay. and so I, I think it's a great concept uh, and, and if you look at it if you look at our 2020 concept back in you know 20 30 years ago that were developed it's not that far removed from that um, creating landfills on the outer harbor and all that but you know you know all you have to do is change the configurations and again it's 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 uh it's, it's, I think it's visionary. Thank you, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, so I have, um, hold on a second. First question is, uh, I just saw, uh, looks like only pound, okay, that's not it. Uh, let me try this one. I, I saw, Stas, if I can uh, address one question of Danny Wan. He asked, what is the, ex the level of public and political acceptance of converting port land to residential and at the same time expanding port operations into water. I mean, this is a very good question. And actually, I also talked a little bit with Tony uh, in the pre-talk. Um, and I, I asked, you know, uh, how, how this is going in the, U in the US. And, and, and let me tell you uh, honestly that in, in the port of Rotterdam, we had the same issue, obviously, because if you move into the sea, there are all kinds of uh, environmental issues that, that are disturbed, right? Because, you know, you make something in water and water becomes land. And, and, and one way of dealing with that, and that's, that's a little bit also how we, how we deal, and that's also culture, obviously, you have to have a good stakeholder process right from the beginning, yeah? So not too late, because if, if, sta if important stakeholders jump into the process too late, they feel left out and they are not going along. So, so with the Port of Rotterdam, they had a good relationship with environmental movements and they made negotiations. And that means that they created the new land, but close to the new, uh, new land, they created a new nature reserve, for example. And that's, that's, that's how it works. Uh, so that's what I try to advocate in this talk, that you have to look broader than only the ports. So look at the wider area and see what is possible with all those stakeholders. And then, then more possibilities and more solutions are possible. But the, but the key to this is a stakeholder process where you have all the stakeholders on board right from the start. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Trenton Saunders, great presentation. What damage functions did you utilize in the cost benefit analysis? Were the damage, damage functions only for inundation or was wave and erosion also considered? Um, e erosion was not considered, so very good question. So we uh, only use the damage functions for uh, houses, infrastructure, and, and, and those kind of facilities. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question, Joshua Hurwitz. 
Uh, would it be fair to guess that the value of the benefits in the LALB concept come mostly from creating the residential areas and that without that component, the costs wouldn't be offset? Uh, yes, um, uh, only investing in, in a new port area to lower flood risk is, uh, no, I wouldn't advise that. Uh, you, you, you do that in the first place also for economic reasons, right? So, to, to accommodate and address the growth in trade. Uh, so that's what's my first slide. Uh, we expect that US ports will grow by 40 to 200% in area. So this will happen. This will happen also in California. And the, the, the question is how to do this, how to do this also in a way that it is flood proof. So only for, for, for flood proofing a port, no. Uh, it, it, you have to look at the other co-benefits as well. Very good. Okay, uh, Jan Novak from the Port of Oakland. How are you addressing air quality issues for the neighborhood? Yeah, um, so, so I talked about noise reduction. I know that in the Port of LA and Long Beach there is a, a small noise wall, so they have, uh, have done something. So the map that I drew was inspired by that, but then I think we need a little bit a, a, a wider buffer zone. So um, air quality is, is not addressed in the plan that we presented, but noise reduction is, is presented uh, by creating this green park and slash bu uh, buffer zone. Okay, um, I have a sort of follow up to the Danny question from David Bazette. Is seaward movement a challenge with current US environmental regulations? And obviously, I think that that's an issue that, that we're going to have to address. Um, I want to just help us out here. Uh, Tony Giuello, uh, you, uh, your port, your Pier 400 uh, development was a move into the sea. Uh, how was that handled? Well, it, it, so again, it started with our 2020 plan, but it actually started as a beneficial reuse of dredge material. Right, and so it, we had a large deepening project to accommodate the larger ships that were projected. We had done a study um, uh, looking at the for forecast of ships. We knew we needed to deepen the channels from a minus 45 foot depth to minus 53 foot depth. And, and we needed to dispose of the material. And so we worked with the resource agencies to, to come with that uh, concept. We did have to mitigate that landfill. We spent, and I, going by memory here, about $40 million for, the, uh, for a mitigation project down in the San Diego area, the Batiquitos Lagoon restoration, uh, to, to mitigate for that landfill for the take. And so it, it was years in the making. It costs a lot of money. Um, and um, that's how we did it. But at the end of the day, um, it, it, was, it was better for everybody, for the resource agencies, for the port, um, to actually create the land, not dispose of the material in the ocean, uh, and then and, and, and handle the mitigation. So it was complex, but it, it was doable. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have one last, how do you handle the environmental requirements and the adaptation as they can be the bottleneck in the process and may slow the flexible adaptation process? Well, I, I think you kind of answered that. Uh, do you want to make any more comment on that? Yeah, no, no let, me, let me stress that I'm not, not saying here that each port should, should move seaward, right? I just wanted to open the discussion that if you look at climate adaptation and the other challenge, which is the, the growing trade, um, that, you look, that you have to look broader than only at your own port, port area. That's, that's the point that I would like to make. And that this, this takes a stakeholder process. And, and that is important. So, so um, yeah, I, I want to say something to, the, to you as poor directors that it is important to, to, you know, to talk with city officials, with, with the stakeholders, with the environmental movements, be on the same page and together face the challenges. And I know that it's difficult, but I think that's the only way to go forward. Very good. Okay. Jeroen, uh, thank you very much. Let me see if we got, uh, um, were there really the level new land needed? Da, da, da. Where, will there really be the level of new land needed as we move away from petroleum products, i.e. in the U.S.? Almost 50% of the goods moved by water are related to petroleum. Currently, we are seeing on both U.S. coasts a shutdown or change of use of these petroleum handling facilities. Are these, uh, are these facilities in the calculation? Yeah, it's a good point. These are, these are in the calculations. Um, but because of the, the, the growth in population globally, there is also a growing in trade of food and agricultural products. 
So there, there's a change also in the goods and services of, of the trade flows. Uh, so it is included in the calculations, yes. Very good, okay. Uh, I think that takes care of us. If I've got anybody else, I don't see anybody. Okay, that's it. Your own, uh, thank you very much for your insights here. Uh, you've given us uh, something to really think about. And I, I, I think that as we are beginning to look at how we're going to protect our breakwater in Southern California, um, obviously, uh, maybe the best means is a good offense. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, panel is from Texas. And uh, we have uh, uh, William Merrill from uh, Texas A&M Galveston. Uh, Mary uh, Develgenazzi, assistant professor at uh, Texas A&M. And do we have Tony Williams? Uh, Bill? Bill? Bill Merrill, can you uh, unmute yourself? Yes, I am. Uh, is Tony Williams here? I, I don't know. Okay. I Tony? I saw him earlier, but uh, I don't see him now. Okay, uh, Tony, if you are here, if you could unmute yourself, otherwise we will move forward. Going once, going twice. Uh, William Merrill uh, is one of, is the pioneer for the coastal protection plan that has been developed by the state of Texas. Uh, it has just been announced in detail by the, uh, you, oh, I see Tony here. Very good. Okay, Tony. Yes, sir. Having a little trouble with my uh, uh, controls there. Sorry about that. Okay, very good. Uh, okay. So, uh, Bill Merrill has been a pioneer here, as I was saying. He has been the spiritual godfather, I think it's fair to say, Bill, uh, of this concept. And uh, he's laughing, so I think that, that is, it's fair to say that, right, Bill? You'll go with Bill, with, with spiritual godfather? No. All right. Uh, we have seen, and, and uh, we had discussed uh, last year with, with uh, Neil Zallen uh, the uh, challenges that Texas is facing. And uh, this could have been a very bad year for Texas because uh, the, uh, there were a number of hurricanes and we just heard about those from Niels and they narrowly missed Texas. Uh, the challenge right now is Galveston Bay is very vulnerable without a serious coastal protection. And <clears throat> there is also in the proposal that's been developed by the Army Corps of Engineers, a storm surge barrier. The total on this project is $26 billion, and I believe 12 of it goes for the uh, storm surge barrier. Uh, Bill, uh, you've been on the ground from the beginning on this. Uh, how urgent is getting this barrier up? Well, we get a um, major hurricane in this area about over 15 years. The um, so far, they seem to be hitting just east of us. Who knows how long that'll happen. Should they hit us, we're talking about damages uh, of well over $100 billion and uh, thousands of deaths. So uh, the wrong hurricane, uh, we're very vulnerable. And of course, uh, Galveston Bay is the uh, center of petrochemical uh, complex in the United States. So you lose a lot of industry also um uh, so we've been looking at protections and uh <clears throat> in fact actually um you want me to go ahead with the presentation now Please. okay yes. uh we've been looking at presentations uh, since since uh since ike i was stuck up in a building on gallison strand during ike and had time so i proposed a um about a month after after I that we do a coastal spine in Texas, essentially based on the Dutch ideas, and it's a very simple idea. It's the idea is to keep the water at the shore, 
at the coast and keep it out of Galveston Bay. If it gets in Galveston Bay, it can slosh around and get you from the back and hurt all kinds of things in Galveston Bay. So you want to keep it from getting in Galveston Bay. Typically under a big hurricane, the, uh, if the Galveston Bay about doubles in, in depth, so it can have much larger surges than if you keep the water out. The design I came up with and uh, further refined with the Dutch um, it's a simple design. It's 17 foot barrier at the coast. Uh, protection gives you pretty good protection from a hundred year storm. You'd have almost no, no damages after Ike, uh, after another Ike going, should you put this in place. Uh, Mary will be talking about, about, the, um, about the economic benefits of, of, what, uh, of these uh, projects. And Tony will be telling you what we're doing now in Texas. Uh, they've taken my concepts, which I'm going to tell you a, a, a little bit about and refined them with the core of engineers and now have a plan that's out for public discussion. Anyhow, the Ike Dike concept, this is, was a month, after, two months after Ike, a, a section I had where it's just a line along the coast. For those that aren't familiar with Galveston Bay, this is the ship channel goes up to uh, Houston. Houston's up in this general area. Uh, it, it, it's about as simple as you can get. You put land barriers on Bolivar Peninsula. This area is where the uh, $13 million Seagate is. Uh, I'll end by showing you a picture of that to still Tony's thunder. And then uh, we, we have the Galveston seawall that already exists in this area and then an advanced area uh, built up again that extends protection of the seawall down West Galveston Island. The whole idea is to keep it out of Galveston Bay. Our plan includes gating San Luis Pass and going further west. The core stops its plan here. So that's a significant difference that, that we have. Uh, if you uh, uh, look at the core plan, which I'll show next, this is their alternative A, the one they adopted. It has pretty much the same placement of the coastal spine, but it, uh, it's a different coastal spine as far as strength. Ours was simple, 17 feet. They have different heights, which I'll go into in, in just a second. Uh, the navigation gate here, Bolivar Roads, you have to allow for big ships and and communication between the Gulf of Mexico and the Bay. And the Corps has done a beautiful job of working that out. That may be my last compliment, Tony, on the Corps, but that's, I think you guys have done a very good job there. I'm not too enthralled with the, uh, with the dune systems for protection. And then they have two, two levels of, of, uh, of uh, defense, if you will, the coastal spine which of course we have advocated and worked on for over a decade now. And then they also put a ring levy around downtown Galveston Island and the airport in Galveston. And they also have structural improvements in two gates on the west side of, uh, of, a, of a Galveston Bay that would provide additional protection there. The um, additional protection you need more and more in the bay when you make this barrier less and less strong. It's the bottom line. If you make the barrier strong enough, you're not going to get much more water in the bay. You don't need too much. Much of, much of all this is because of uh, factoring and sea level rise. But they look at this project would have to be effective through 2085 and you have a lot of sea level rise by then. You build it now to, to that the way the Congress treats the Corps, you can't do adaptive management. So you've got to build it now to last through 2085. If we look at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Texas GLO, and Tony is from the Texas GLO, who will be talking in a minute. It has two lines of defense, the Gulf and in Bay, as I said. The Gulf defense is also a coastal spine, but it differs in effective protection heights. 22 feet at Bolivar Road's gates, at the gates across the Houston Chip Channel, 21 foot at the Galveston Seawall, and then 12 and 14 foot dunes on the land barriers. 
we think that uh, you really ought to rethink this a little bit and have a much more uh, similar, but uh, Tony will justify his. The old Ike Dyke concept, and I came up with the term Ike Dyke and have regretted it since the first time I used it. It's one of those sticky names that won't go away. Uh, we've tried and tried to get it to go away, and it just won't. But anyhow, we have the same basic footprint for the coastal spine and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers concept. But important difference in the western extent, they do not gate San Luis Pass. And uh, we think getting it would keep the force surge and surge out of Galveston Bay, or help at least. Uh, USA said keeps the pass open. <clears throat> the design is in the public comment period. We're certainly going to comment, and there's many good aspects of, of this plan, and we intend to comment on those, and we have a few concerns. We'll be communicating to the, uh, to, to the Corps and the Texas GLO also, and I'll end with a picture of the $13 million gates. This is the uh, Bolivar Peninsula, Galveston Island. This is about a two-mile stretch. You would have these two series of uh, the Rotterdam type gates that we've already seen once, the swinging uh, so-called floating sector gates. Uh, there's, there's issues with these gates, but they would work here, but you'd have an in and an out channel. So it's a little different than Rotterdam that has one big series of gates. And then uh, the uh, different uh, uh, gate series, you'd have vertical lift gates, which would allow a lot of flow of a combi wall over in certain areas and then shallow water environmental gates here on the east end that would allow larvae flow. It's a very well thought out system. Uh, the Corps uh, was very wise to work with the ice storm uh, network, which is the network of uh, barrier operators throughout the world. They came over and had a, a series here and I think have come up with a very nice design. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tony, unless there's questions that you'd like for me to answer now. Uh, I think what we'll do, Bill, is we'll hold the questions up to the end of the presentation. Great, thank you. Uh, Bill, thank you very much. Uh, Tony Williams, uh, we, yes. uh, we can hear you. Uh, can we see you? Here, here Tony, let me fix this for you. Um, here, clear the uh, screen and let me go, let me get Tony here. Tony. Can I share my screen? You should. Uh, hang, hang on, let me see. Let me, uh, we're trying to see if we can see you. Trying to find you in here a moment. Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. Now so, you should be able to. I've got a backup too if you can't, but you should be able to now, Tony. Okay. Tony? Uh, see me now. Okay. Tony Williams is the Environmental Review Coordinator for the Texas General Land Office. And as uh, uh, Bill Merrill uh, was describing, uh, the Texas uh, General Land Office has been the uh, lead agency for the state of Texas in moving this coastal uh, protection system along <clears throat> and developing the storm surge barrier, which uh, Bill Merrill just referred to. Uh, Tony, welcome very much uh, to you. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, being with us. Um, you recently announced, uh, or the Army Corps just recently announced uh, uh, a, a $26 billion plan, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir, it's a comprehensive plan for the, the entire coast of Texas. It includes the uh, storm surge barrier for the uh, Galveston, Houston area, eight large-scale ecosystem restoration projects and some uh, storm surge protection for the South Padre Island as well. But the biggest part is in the Houston Galveston area. Okay. So uh, really want to uh, appreciate Dr. Merrill. He's, uh, like you said earlier, he's kind of the guru of this. Everybody turns to him uh, whenever anything comes up about this. Um, and, you know, we really appreciate him and his team working with us in the Corps of Engineers on uh, developing this plan. Uh, we've tried to incorporate his input. We, we're, we're not exactly the same. Uh, we're by and large very similar in our plans. Um, there are a little bit of differences and we can discuss those, but I'll, I'll go through our plan 
uh, real quickly. I, I know I don't have much time. So um, you might not be familiar with Texas, but it is a, uh, a very diverse coast. Um, like uh, Dr. Merrill said, the Port of Houston, uh, Texas City, Galveston, uh, some of the largest ports in the country, uh, the hub of the petrochemical industry, not just oil and gas, but uh, create a lot of plastics and uh, feedstock for other manufacturing around the United States. Um, the Galveston Bay is a uh, recreational and commercial fishing area, a lot of bird washing. Uh, the entire Texas coast has a lot of eco-tourism. Uh, uh, the very diverse habitat, we have Galveston Bay, we have a lot of marshes in the upper coast, and we have a hypersaline lagoon down the lower coast, the Laguna Madre. So there is a, it's a very diverse system. And it's at risk from uh, relative sea level rise. Uh, uh, somebody, I can't remember who talked about that the Houston Galveston area has a higher sea level rise than other areas. That's because we're having some subsidence in that area. Um, so we have relative sea level rise, we have uh, increased erosion, and all this has given us uh, very strong hurricanes that are having significant impact. Uh, we've, at one point, we had three of the top 10 hurricanes. I don't know if uh, from a money, uh, financial impact, I don't know if that's still the case. And also the deadliest natural disaster in US history was the 1900 hurricane that hit Galveston. So it is a, a, a tremendous threat and um, it would impact not only loss of life, loss of habitat, um, also um, dramatic impact to the uh, national economy of the oil and gas petrochemical industry associated with Houston was to be impacted. So um, Corps of Engineers and GLO started this study, uh, signed the agreement in 2015. The Corps actually was doing the scoping before that. And actually the project really kicked off in 2016 trying to come up, with a, um, come up with a comprehensive plan to address storm surge and ecosystem restoration, and, and as much as possible have the two work together. I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly, uh, just hit the highlights. So what we tried to do is come up with, with multiple lines of defense. We incorporated what Dr. Merrill came up with, the Ike Dyke, and everybody still calls our, the, our plan the Ike Dyke, even though it's, it's very similar, but somewhat different. Um, but started off trying to keep as much of the storm surge in the Gulf as possible, keep it out of the bay as much as possible. Um, and then we have some uh, the backside uh, protection that uh, Dr. Merrill pointed out. You have a hurricane, if it's a spinning, it goes into Galveston Bay. Uh, the wind key, it still drives a lot of the water that is in Galveston Bay up on the west side and on the backside of Galveston. And as you get the relative sea level rise, that impact increases. So uh, we have that second line of defense. And then also we incorporate the ecosystem restoration. Uh, that enhances the, the resilience of the entire coast. Uh, some of the ecosystem restoration projects uh, directly benefit, uh, say, evacuation routes or the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. So we tried to come up with uh, projects that had multiple benefits. And um, I'll, I'll get to one of those in just a minute. I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. So this is our proposal. Uh, we have up in the Houston Galveston area, we have the storm surge barrier and the embay protection. And we also have a lot of ecosystem restoration up in this area here. And then uh, across San Luis Pass, uh, we have a, uh, a beach and dune restoration project. Uh, it's not exactly what Dr. Merrill proposes, but it does maintain that barrier between uh, the bay system and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, right behind the, there's a very narrow spit of land there and just inland of the, uh, that spit of land is the uh, Christmas Bay Coastal Preserve. And it's a very pristine uh, water body that uh, we almost lost that barrier near an Ike. And we want to keep this uh, ecosystem restoration project not only provides the uh, beach and dune habitat, which is uh, critical for wintering um, endangered birds, uh, nesting habitat for sea turtles, but provides that barrier between the Gulf of Mexico and the habitat in uh, Christmas Bay. So it's, it really provides multiple benefits. And we also have some uh, ecosystem restoration in there that provides uh, a barrier between uh, the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, which is a inland waterway that is used by a lot of barges and um, maintains a barrier between that waterway and the marshes that are associated with the bay systems back there. Uh, and on down the coast, we have 
a very similar project. It's one that maintains a barrier between the uh, Corpus Christi ship channel and seagrass beds. Uh, and then in the uh, lower Laguna Madre, we have one that uh, maintains Padre Island National Seashore. Um, because of some changes to the uh, sediment flow in that area, uh, Padre Island is, is at risk of being breached. So we looked at an opportunity to maintain uh, dredge a channel, maintain the hydrological connection, uh, put the sand on Padre Island National Seashore to maintain that barrier between the Gulf of Mexico and the Laguna Madre, which is a, uh, a hypersaline lagoon, and also uh, maintain a bird island. And then we utilize uh, beach and dune enhancement in South Padre Island uh, as a storm surge barrier. So I'll get uh, more into the kind of the star of the show here, the uh, Houston Galveston um, area. And if you want to talk about the ecosystem restoration, I'd love to do that, but I think people will be more interested in this. So like Dr. Merrill said, uh, we started off with uh, this alternative A. So this is the second time we've released a feasibility report. The first time uh, was in 2018. And at that point, we had basically five different options we were comparing. Uh, we were one that was similar to Dr. Merrill's and a couple other groups. It was basically along the uh, Bolivar Peninsula and Galveston Island and putting a gate system here at uh, the Galveston Ship Channel. And then we had some interior uh, protection for that wind-driven storm surge. And then we looked at a couple of different options that moved it up in the bay. This is one we kind of came up with utilizing uh, some spoil disposal islands on the backside of Gal uh, Bolivar Peninsula and an existing dike here in Texas City and a levee system that here is here in Texas City. And then we utilized uh, a report that the Corps did in the 70s that recommended a, a mid-bay barrier. Uh, we compared that as an alternative. And then there were a couple of different groups that were looking at protection just on the western uh, rim of Galveston Bay and um, looked at these different options. And like Dr. Merrill said, we uh, identified the one that uh, keeps the as much storm surge as possible in the Gulf as the, the best alternative. And uh, we put, put that out, got a lot of input on that, and then we've tweaked that. But um, this was the alternative that was uh, selected and moved forward. Um, a lot of the input uh, was on, um, we were suggesting a uh, levee system, and this was based on some work that was done by another group. Uh, there was the levee system was down Bolivar and down um, Galveston Island, and there was a lot of opposition to that. There was a, a strong preference for uh, having uh, some sort of system at the dunes, uh, similar to what Dr. Merrill has uh, proposed, uh, and we moved to that. Uh, we actually took our ecosystem restoration project, which was beach and dune restoration, and made that a dual purpose uh, project, which was uh, keep us. Uh, coastal storm risk management or storm surge protection and ecosystem restoration. This is the gate design that we had in our 2018 report. Uh, this system here uh, was a little larger than the Mazelon barrier, um, 60 foot deep, about 1200 feet wide. Um, it was not a lot larger, but a little bit larger than the Mazelon system. And then we had 30 uh, lift gates here to maintain connection between the Gulf of uh, Mexico and uh, Galveston Bay, and then we had a, a combi wall over here, a combination wall. I'll go over these in uh, more detail in a little bit. Um, but this was the proposal uh, in 2018, and this had about a 27% restriction on the uh, exchange between the Gulf of Mexico and Galveston Bay, and we knew that that was really too high, and I'll go over uh, something that Dr. Merrill mentioned, our work with iStorm, how uh, we were able to improve this. So uh, we took our, our, in, our input from our original um, release and we tweaked our design. We now have the, the two barriers here, and I'll go over this in more detail, and we moved from a levee system to a, a beach and dune system. So our, our beach and dune system starts at the existing line of vegetation and moves uh, seaward. It has a 250 foot uh, sand beach and a double dune system that has a 12 foot fore dune and a 14 foot uh, back dune. Um, our modeling shows that this reduces uh, the storm surge significantly. Uh, we're still looking at the work that Dr. Merrill is doing and we will continue to develop this design in, um, in our, in when the project moves into PED. 
uh, but this is what we're recommending at this point. Um, people in uh, Texas love to get out on the beach. It's, uh, we have the Open Beaches Act. People can drive on much of the beaches in Texas. And so we've incorporated some uh, drive overs and walk overs to maintain access to the beach that is in compliance with the current uh, beach access plan. And there's a, one of the big questions we get is where do you get the sand for this? There's some banks that are offshore uh, of Galveston, the Sabine and Held Bank. They have adequate sand for this. We're looking at trying to find the closer uh, sand sources and we've had some, some initial um, success with that, but we really need to continue looking at that. We're working with Bohm and other groups looking at that. And so uh, what we did with our, our gate system, we had a uh, workshop that we had with the International Storm Surge Barrier Group, the Ice Storm. Uh, we had folks from uh, the Netherlands, uh, folks from the UK. We had folks that worked on the St. Petersburg system. We had uh, uh, folks that worked on the Venice system come over and, and people from really all over the world, people from A&M uh, came over and worked with us. Um, it, we had these groups, we, we sat down with them and tried to come up with a way to improve our gate system. Um, I'm a marine biologist. The first thing we did, we took them out on a boat in the, in the Galveston uh, ship channel here and looked over here at this shallow water. This is where a lot of the, the fish and, and larval exchange come in through uh, the, the ship channel is over here in this shallow area. And we said we have to maintain this shallow area and come up with a way to do that. Uh, and we have to maintain as much water flow as we can between the Gulf and Galveston Bay. We're at 27.5%, that's way too high. We need to come up with a way to reduce that. And we need to make this gate system as resilient as possible. Uh, so um, we came up with, a, a, went from a single gate system uh, to a double gate system, and we'll go over this in a little more, more detail in a little bit. Um, and we also went to, um, we had these small uh, gates here that allow the smaller ships that have mass not to have to go through the, the large gate with the ships. And then we went away from uh, the multiple, a lot of small gates to uh, less larger gates. That reduces their constriction. And then we went over here to um, what we call shallow water gates. And I'll go over this in a little more detail and then a combi wall. And so uh, the shallow water gates are basically uh, box culverts. This is uh, uh, technology that's been used in the past. Basically, I can describe it as a box culvert with a garage door on it so it can come down and shut the, the, the gate off and when uh, we need to, to keep storm surge out, but it's open the vast majority of the time. And this allows for uh, that shallow water exchange. Um, and we're looking at ways to maintain the, uh, like a, a permeable surface on the top here to maintain the lighting to, you know, have as little impact as possible to the exchange of the larval. Uh, we also have a combi wall over here in this area. It's the combination wall. It's basically just a, a flood wall to keep the storm surge out. Um, and then we looked at the uh, larger uh, areas. These are 300 foot, um, lift gates, and again, this is technology that's been used in the past. Tried and true, we have some uh, lift gates, not on this same size, but in, uh, in the United States, we have some in Texas, just up in Texas City. And there's a little bitty picture of a guy, that's a man right there. So that's kind of giving you the scale. These are about a football field length uh, in width here. And then we looked at our, um, our floating sector gate, again, uh, our initial plan was to have something uh, along the same size, a little bit larger than the Mazelon barrier. And the uh, folks with Ice Storm, they said, don't do that. Go with something that's been tried and true. Don't kind of, don't come up with something bigger than you need. And um, they suggested having these, uh, the double barriers. Um, not only does that uh, reduce the size and the cost, but it also gives you some redundancy in case one of them wants to break down. So uh, we moved to this and having the uh, two gates, it uh, allows us to uh, increase the exchange of water um, between Galveston Bay and the Gulf. And we've gotten that down 
between seven and 10%, depending on the, the tidal, uh, tide, um, whether it's high tide or low tide. So that really reduces the impact associated um, with the change to the tidal amplitude within Galveston Bay. It went from about six inches to less than an inch. So um, uh, we, that really reduced the amount of mitigation that was required. And also, um, we did have to come up with a way to mitigate for these islands. And these islands are so large so they can uh, protect the ships when they're going through the channel. Um, we are creating oyster reef to offset the loss of bay bottom habitat by these islands. Um, but we also worked with the, the pilots and the ports and, and they like the, the separated uh, channels coming in and out. So that uh, had multiple benefits. Um, and like I said earlier, the, uh, the cost is 26.2 billion. And as you see, the, the, the vast majority of that is for the gate system, the beach and dune. Um, the inside the bay has about six uh, a billion, and then you have the ecosystem restoration and the, um, and the uh, South Padre Island. But if you look at the impact from uh, Ike, it's well more than this, and those were uh, $2,008. So this system could easily pay for itself. Um, we have a lot, a lot of this information, and even more is on our website. It's at coastalstudy.texas.gov. Um, there's a lot of uh, information on there. We had some computer folks do story maps that go through all of this and, and, and do a very excellent uh, presentation of the data. Um, I'm, I'm assuming I've probably gone long already. So uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Seth. Okay, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I thought it was important that we hear this. It's the most uh, 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 innovative and uh, uh, definitely uh, pioneering effort uh, that we have. And uh, we will hold our questions to the end. Uh, uh, Mary Daval Genardzi, uh, can you hear me? I'm, I'm, uh, Mary, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry, I had the little glitch on my end. Uh, Mary has done a report about the cost benefit analysis of what happens if you do and do not, if you do not uh, take this course. And I found this to be very compelling because at a time when we are talking about the costs of these infrastructure programs and who's going to pay for it and is it, uh, excess spending and this and that and the other. <clears throat> uh, her uh, report has indicated that there's a substantial uh, damage to the state's economy if you do not uh, take uh, this course. And uh, Mary, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm very interested in uh, this study and I think it would help put some perspective on the urgency for us moving forward here. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's a, it's a great pleasure to present these uh, findings uh, on national level economic ripple effects of the so storm surge. And uh, as uh, Bill and Tony have been discussing, it's, uh, this is a region of the great importance and just quantifying these benefits in terms of the local economy is not just enough to really have the picture and the broader picture of the, how important this surge barrier is for the not only the local economy but also for the entire nation and specifically we look how the direct impacts on the specific sectors in the bay communities would propagate to the entire economy of texas as well as on the economy of the other states and the nation as a whole and while we also capture this general equilibrium and the multiplier effects and i'm going to briefly talk about this so we built this uh, this study was supported by glo and uh, we are very thankful for uh, this uh, support we built this a huge state level uh, computable general equilibrium model, which is one of the most advanced models in terms of the economic models that uh, we have seen in the, in the literature and the scholars have used. It's a multi-sector, multi-year state level model that uh, uh, 
uh, allows us to capture the spillover effects across the regions as well as look these impacts over time in the long term. So we looked at the 50 year time frame because this is uh, when we can make some sort of projections about economic growth. And uh, the basic premise of this model is that it has, it's sort of a very good depiction of the uh, market interactions that we see in the, in the economy. We have consumers, we have producers, we have government and the trade sector. And through these linkages, we build these uh, impacts that uh, could propagate from one directly impacted sectors to the other interconnected sectors. And um, uh, so uh, consumers or the households are endowed with the supply of labor and capital. This is how it is and it works in the economy. And firms then employ this labor and capital and they pay rent for their, uh, for these inputs of productions. And the government, of course, collects taxes and also spends money for the goods and services. And also this model covers both domestic as well as international trade. And given the sub, uh, significant importance of the Bay uh, regional economy to the, not only to, uh, the national economy, but also for international trade, we, we thought that the, this would be very applicable model for that. So the direct impacts, the way we model here, we looked at two primary sectors. One is the residential housing or the dwelling sector, which uh, is uh, one of the primary sectors that would be impacted by surge because the, uh, the houses are destroyed. And we employed this Hazus, uh, FEMA, FEMA Hazus model, which is the engineering loss model that estimates the property values. Uh, value loss uh, and it allows also the granular property level data to be updated so that uh, losses are more precise and accurate and we have uh, had the ways to validate those losses and also we looked at the petrochemical and chemical manufacturing industries specifically we since we do not ha have a good knowledge how much damages the structures and the infrastructure sustain in those facilities we have um, uh, assumed that uh, the impact that these uh, sectors would sustain would be through the shutdowns of the operations because storm surge either there is a active warning period that uh, employees cannot go to work or there is a power outage or a system breakdown or something like that that would force these uh, facilities to be down. And in fact, if you look at the, some of the historical hurricanes, such as Hurricane Ike and Katrina, we saw that on average, the plants are down around 26 days. We're down during these events. Also, uh, the maximum, I think, uh, average of Hurricane Katrina was around 33 days and the average of the sample was about 18 days. So we, we use this as a scenarios to build the output losses that this uh, plant would sus will sustain because they are down for either precautionary or some other reasons, uh, whether, whether it's a power outage or the uh, failure of their main system that um, uh, is the main driver of their operations. And indirect impacts, of course, was uh, looked through the general equilibrium effects and as we know that uh, prices of the many inputs, whether it's capital, labor, or also outputs would change because of the surge. And there is a substitution effect from the higher price goods to the lower price goods. So the economic impact would be seen through that. And also there is a multiplier effect that because uh, incomes are affected of uh, people who are impacted by surge events, there are some changes in the consumption pattern, patterns that would have further um, uh, economic impacts and ramifications. We have modeled the economy without the storm surge and we call it the business as usual scenario where we assume that the population will grow, the productivity will grow, so the economy will grow at its projected growth path. So this will, would give us sort of an ideal economic situation where we do not have any, any interruption. And then we compare to that scenario the scenario that the surge impacts the regional economy and then what is the difference between the businesses as, as usual where the economy would have been if there was no storm surge event and where economy is because of the storm surge event. And also we have uh, looked at the mitigation effect of the coastal spine to see how the coastal spine would, would mitigate this impact. We have used these ADSARC models for the, um, to generate the synthetic storms and we looked at multiple storms, 500 year storm is one of the largest or the strongest and most intense storms in terms of the destructiveness. We also looked at 100 year storm surge and also 10 year storm surge and uh, we have also reproduced Ike-like storms since uh, this was a sort of a storm that has spurred this and the idea of the Ike-Dike. 
uh, and impacts with and without the coastal spine was also integrated. And I'm going to give you the total direct losses that we have estimated with the property and industry losses. And as you can see, if the industry is down for 33 days, the total losses is around with the 500 storm level is over $16 billion. It's just, these are just the direct losses. And uh, for the 100 year storms, it's over $6 billion. And for, of course, 10 year storm is much, uh, much lesser in magnitude. It's only 615 storm and if there is a surge event these impacts are almost eight times less it's uh, see uh, the, with the surge barrier the direct impacts and of course the uh, how these impacts and propagate to the entire economy is, uh, is another story that we have looked at so the texas economy in the 50 years time what was uh, one of the impressive findings of this study was that even this impacts last uh, uh, has is very persistent over the long term and we have shocked the economy in 2016, we assumed that, okay, there is a 500 year, year storm and what would be its impact in the 50 years time? And Texas GDP uh, shrinks by 8%, which is around $863 billion. It's a, it's a, it's a huge, huge number. And if, if there is a coastal spine, then this uh, estimate decline is done only by 2%. So it's, uh, it's almost four times less than uh, uh, what we would uh, see if there was no surge barrier. And all macroeconomic indicators in Texas, except for the government expenditures, decline and the government expenditure increases because of there is a response uh, due to the surge events in terms of the recovery and the assistance and uh, probably goods and services become more expensive. And also one of the, uh, the net export also declines significantly, partially because these uh, petrochemicals are one of the traded goods that uh, this region uh, generates uh, by 13%. National economy, we also looked at 50 years time, US GDP declines by 1.1%, which is also a significant decline. Just to give you sort of a perspective, these declines is comparable to, the, to some uh, huge economic depressions and uh, the declines that the uh, US has experienced in the past due to uh, financial crisis. And this uh, GDP decline is reduced uh, to 0.28% if there is no, if the coastal protection is in place. And also US net exports declines in the 50 years time that we estimate by 4%. 4 and investment and household consumption also declined by estimated $167 billion and 0.83% um, for the consumption. So as, as far as the, the economies of the other states, uh, it showed that the Texas economy is the one that's most impacted because of the dependence of this, uh, the economic sectors, that, which are drivers of the economic activities. And some, except for the few states, which are neighboring states that might benefit because of the surge event in Texas, because of the substitution effects and uh, suppliers and consumers might shift uh, uh, their consumption to other states. We see that majority of the states, and they're highlighted in pink, would experience a decline because of this uh, uh, petroleum and petrochemical products are used almost in all the uh, production operations for other sectors. And we also looked at um, uh, sectoral impact, as I've said, housing sector would be the most impacted in Texas. Uh, petroleum refineries and chemical manufacturing also decline, and there are also jobs, job losses that would be associated if there is no, no barrier. Uh, and with the, with the spine, these impacts are substantially um, mitigated. I also want to give you sort of a snapshot of uh, what these impacts translate, because we have several synthetic storms. It's, it's interesting to know what is in, an, in a given year, what is the average impact that we are expecting from if there was any of these events uh, uh, have realized. So we, we adjusted these impacts by the, the return probabilities of the storms. And uh, we calculate that in a given year, Texas economy, given that it's facing the, the, these probabilistic events of the surge, would experience the GDP will decline by $74 billion, which is much, much higher than what the cost, uh, cost uh, that Tony has shown of the, this uh, huge massive uh, barrier system and the, or the coastal uh, protection system that they have been talking about. And the USA and the US national GDP also declines by $77 billion and the government expenditures increases in, in both cases. And this is all I have. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope I was not too, too fast, but given the time limitation, that's the best I could do. Mary, thank you very much for this. And uh, this is really um, a, a very important uh, look at what happens when we don't do anything. 
and not doing anything uh, has uh, a ca almost catastrophic impact. Uh, now I'm going to open up for questions and let me see if, uh, uh, do we have uh, questions? I saw some earlier and I'm, uh, let me see if I've got any. Uh, Todd, did you see any questions? Uh, no, I don't see any new ones. Okay, um, let me let me start. Tony uh, Tony Williams. Um, just to clarify, uh, originally uh, we saw a uh, uh, a figure of about thirty six billion dollars uh, for the uh, total program, and that's now gone down substantially. Uh, I know you talked about it a little bit in your presentation, but what uh, what what were some of the major factors that drove those uh, costs down? Well, the, actually, the cost, that was a range released in the initial report, and it was about $21 billion to about $33 billion. Um, okay. But one of the things that we've been able to do is refine that cost a good bit by uh, uh, looking in more detail. And, uh, and some of the changes that we've done, uh, initially we had uh, a ecosystem restoration project in Galveston, Bolivar, and a levee system. Uh, being able to combine those has reduced the overall cost a good bit as well, and uh, and and looked at some ways to uh, reduce other costs. So it's it, it was more uh, refining the cost than uh, a drastic reduction in the cost. Very good, thank you, Stas. Uh, Stas, there were some uh, on the uh, chat. I, yeah, I see. Uh, this is for Bill Merrill. Uh, Bill, uh, the questioner says, like uh, Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina. How was the effect of back surge within Galveston Bay considered in the original concept? Well, the, yes, the, uh, the amount of back surge that you get is directly proportional to the height of the bay. So if you don't let the force surge into the bay, what we were seeing is that Galveston Bay would be much deeper by the time the regular surge hit. And just like Lake, Lake Pontchartrain, a lot of water is blowing up into it through, through Lake Bourne. And so what you get is a lot deeper bay and therefore you have a lot higher surge. The surge can only be about equal to the depth of the bay, average depth. So if you just keep the water out of Galveston Bay, that helps. Now that doesn't totally prevent it, especially with sea level rise. So with sea level rise, we're gonna to have to add some of those in bay defenses that Tony described, uh, the ring around uh, Galveston and some uh, work in uh, the uh, Clear Lake, the Dickinson area. Okay, um, the next questioner says, what extent of the proposed ecosystem restoration is required as mitigation for the construction of the storm surge barrier system and what compensatory mitigation is required to be established before the construction of the barrier is complete. Uh, Tony, is that your uh, question? Yes, sir, it is. And um, the ecosystem restoration is not, it's completely separate from the mitigation. It's, it's a completely separate action. There is mitigation identified. Uh, it's about 800 acres of uh, mitigation to uh, offset the indirect impacts of the gate system. Uh, basically, what we did, we looked at the changes in tidal amplitude in Galveston Bay. It's uh, the, the intertidal marsh basically goes from mean high tide to mean low tide. And we looked at how much of that was lost as a result of the, um, of the changes in tidal amplitude. And we worked with the natural resource agencies to identify some areas as close as possible to the gate system to, um, to do that mitigation. And then we looked at the impacts from the other systems, the ring barrier, uh, the impact of the island, like I said, we, we did uh, uh, for those island for the gates, uh, we did oyster reef mitigation for that. And we did about, I think about 100 acres of mitigation on the island. I can't remember the exact number, but to offset the direct impacts as well. So the mitigation that will go in, uh, that will be built uh, with the, the actual uh, system. Uh, then that is separate than the uh, ecosystem restoration. So we're, we're really hoping both of those will go forward simultaneously. Um, and if you look at the, the mitigation, 
uh, if you reduce the, the uh, tidal amplitude change, it will take years, decades, of, and well, with changes in sea level, we might not ever see that loss of habitat. So, you know, but we'll go ahead and do the mitigation for that and create the, the uh, additional uh, salt marsh. Okay. Uh, Martin, uh, you've got a very long, complicated question here, and we're uh, going to run out of time, but I'm going to do this one. Uh, but uh, uh, your own Ertz has a question, which is, who's going to pay for this? That, that's a good question. Um, and they're all, they're all good questions. Uh, uh, but the um, for a federal project, the construction cost is typically 65% federal government, 35% non-federal uh, sponsor. We're working with the Texas State Legislature to identify where those funds are going to come from. The Texas Legislature meets every other year. Uh, they're going to meet in January, and this is uh, one of the top priorities for uh, Commissioner Bush and several of the legislatures to make sure that Texas is in a place to move forward when the report is presented to Congress. Okay, that's a, that's, okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, Martin's question, is why protect only until a one uh, in 100 year flood level? Why not choose protection level that follows from a cost benefit analysis? Um, and two, he's asking for the sector gates in Rotterdam, there's currently a discussion about the reliability of these larger types of sector barriers. They are even considering replacing them. Uh, Tony, you wanna take a shot at those two? Sure. Um... Well, I'll, I'll do the second one first. Um, we're working with the iStorm folks continuously. Uh, we, they've been very gracious in letting us come over and look at the, the Mazelon barrier, uh, the Eastern Shelf barrier um, in the Netherlands as well. The uh, Venice folks have been working with us, the folks over in the UK and the Thames barrier. And you know they've been sharing all their information with us. And we understand that this design is going to continue to need to be um, uh, refine moving forward. Uh, we took what seemed to be the best option out there and applied it to uh, the system we have here, um, but we will continue to look at other options moving forward, and if, if a better design comes forward, we will definitely incorporate it. So um, that, that, that's an excellent point. Um, and the other one uh, about design for the 100-year storm, when the, the core looks at these type of projects, they do a probabilistic type uh, design. They look at, uh, for the, the study, we use 600 storms, synthetic storms that range from a uh, tropical storm to a, an excess of a 500 year storm. And basically looked at uh, the probability of those storms coming in and what the, the benefits of the whole range of storms would be. And so that's how the, the core, I, I, I didn't do it, that, that's outside of my realm of expertise, but that's how they came up with the heights and the cost benefit ratio and the, the net benefits. Okay. Um, and Mary, I, I have a question if you, to, if you could maybe just bottom line, if we build it, uh, if we don't build it, what is the cost to Texas by not building uh, this coastal uh, system? The, the cost is huge, as I've, as I've shown, at least the $75 billion loss in GDP every year because these uh, events are expecting to become more frequent with the sea level rise, with not account for the sea level rise, one in every 100 year storm surge would become one in every four year storm. This is what has been suggested by the sea level rise and depending how much the sea would rise, then this uh, might become more frequent and more intense and damaging. I think uh, the, it would be devastating just uh, responding to these events uh, and addressing the consequences in terms of the reco recovery is gonna be huge. And uh, the toll would not be no, not only on Texas economy, but on the US national economy, because we know that in US disaster risk management is primarily reactive and post disaster, there is a huge surge of the federal support and this money is spent from the taxpayers money that uh, live in other areas and this money could have spent on more productive uses probably we can find for this money to be spent rather than on disaster recovery. If we can proactively manage this, uh, this problem that we are facing. That's a, that's a bottom line. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks. 
I, I, I want to, uh, Bill, yes. I just wanted to add a little bit to the level of protection uh, answer Tony gave. Tony was, of course, right. That's exactly how the Corps does it. They tend to have a hundred year protection for all their projects, kind of whether it makes sense or not. Uh, that's been argued quite a bit. If you use the Dutch approach, is where you look at what type of protection is actually needed and you apply it to Houston, which we've done very crudely, you come up with about a 2000 year protection would be the most cost and official. Um, and typically you'll see the Dutch coast is um, protected, uh, the, um, the built up area at one in 10,000 years and the less built up one in 4,000 years. So they typically protect a lot more than we do in the United States. Okay. Um, I just want to, uh, I'm, I'm going to conclude here, but I, I just want, I, I thought this, the, the Texas uh, case is forward looking. Um, it is what the future needs to look like nationwide. And uh, uh, the people involved here in Texas, Texas Land Office, the Army Corps of Engineers, our panelists are talking about something that needs to start happening now. Uh, the next time uh, a hurricane heads up Galveston Bay, uh, everybody is going to see why not moving ahead on these things is about to have disastrous consequences. And Mary's uh, cost-benefit analysis gives us some bottom line parameters for all of us to think about. I wanna thank Tony, Mary, and w Bill for their excellent presentations. Uh, this is really a wake up call for us in the United States. And I want to say this is something that we need to be doing on a national basis with every coastal community. And we need to put this in an infrastructure bill and stop letting people tell us uh, we can't afford it. Uh, we're not going to spend more money. It's uh, nanny state or whatever it is. It is protecting our future. It is protecting our communities. And as your own Ertz uh, said before, and uh, Mary and uh, Tony and Bill have alluded, it adds value to the state of Texas. It will add value to wherever our coasts are under siege. So thank you all very much for this. Um, we are going to have a 15 minute break so everybody can uh, take a breather. We will be showing uh, uh, the names of our sponsors. Uh, we will be back. Uh, I, I'm going to say we're going to be back uh, in, at about uh, five, seven minutes after the hour. So thank you all very much. And uh, our next speakers are coming from Louisiana, uh, Sean Duffy, uh, Mark Wingate, uh, Matthew Gresham, and uh, Suzanne Van Kooten. So we'll see you in about uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Gus, there was one question there, if you, okay. if you think you want to answer it. It's, uh, there's a, assuming that everything goes well, when is the project expected to be completed and in operation? Thank you. Uh, Tony? Uh, yes, I'll give that. Um, the report is out, there's a draft report that's out now. Uh, the comment period closes in December. Um, the, in the final report and chief's report from the Corps of Engineers should be completed in uh, May timeframe of next year. And then hoping, we're hoping that we'll be able to get it in the WERDA 2022 uh, Water Resources Development Act. That's where the Corps uh, approves projects to move forward, or the Corps of Congress approves projects for the Corps of Engineers to move forward. Um, and uh, that's, that's one of the reasons it's critical that Texas do something in this legislative session. Um, and then uh, hopefully we'll move into PED, uh, Realistically, we're thinking probably 2035 is, is really the earliest we could have that system in place. Okay, very good. Tony, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, you have a break. Uh, we'll be back uh, uh, seven minutes after the hour. <laughs>